Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Here Come the Doughboys, tracing your World War I military ancestors here at the Fountaindale Public Library uh, in Bolingbrook. Uh, the next session that we have scheduled today is the Spirit of St. Louis, accessing records at the NRPC. Um, so we wanna make sure that you all have all of the handouts that are available for download, as well as the supplementals that are available both on our website and here in the room. Uh, remember that this is part of our World War I in America program, uh, which is a two-year initiative uh, presented by the Library of America in partnership with the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History, the National World War I Museum, and Memorial, and other organizations with the general support, uh, generous support of the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we, we want to make them uh, and show our appreciation for making this day possible. Um, so for the next session that we have, we're gonna go through the National Personnel Records Center uh, with Tina Baird. So if you'll please give Tina a warm round of applause. Thank you. Well, hello again to everybody in attendance as well as everybody online. They know that I've been struggling between sessions with a terrible cold that I've come down with thanks to my son. So I'm gonna do my best to not go hoarse on you. So the records I'm gonna talk about for the next hour are the records that you'll find at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis. So I touched on these records a little when I was talking about looking for official military personnel files and I touched on a little bit the fire that happened in 1973. So on July 12th, the fire broke out in the National Archives building in, in St. Louis, and that fire lasted and continued for a couple of days. It, they didn't get the fire completely extinguished for three days. Millions and millions of gallons of water had to be poured into this building, <coughs> into this floor, in order to put out the still smoldering fire. So not only were records lost because of the initial fire damage, but you had lots of records that eventually were lost over the mold and the mildew that started to build up on these records after that time as well. So 80%, I mean, that is a staggering number. You have over 16 million files, you know, were destroyed or, or heavily damaged during that fire. And they cover a huge swath of our military history timeline. So from November of 1912 until January of 1960, you know, only 20% of these Army and Army Air Corps records actually survived the fire. You know, 75% of Air Force records leading up to 1964. So very often, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to get a letter back from the National Archives that says, we don't have a file for this particular veteran because it was one of the records that was damaged in the fire. We're lucky, at least for me, um, in my World War II records research that my Navy and my Marine records were untouched. And that's true for the First World War as well. And I'll show you an example of one of those records. So if you were lucky enough to have somebody in these two branches of the military, then that entire file is accessible to you and you can request it or you can go down and view it. But if they were in the Army or the Army Air Corps or the Air Force, then you're running into a lot of roadblocks. And if you're just interested and you want to know more about what happened and more about the fire and the recreation of fire records, I give you the link down here at the bottom where you can read more. They've been working really hard over the course of these last 20 years to try to recreate files that were destroyed. And when I mean recreate, I don't just mean bringing in records from other governmental agencies like the hospital records, like the final payment vouchers, but actually try to restore and recreate those originally damaged fire records using things like 3D technology. So what they're doing is they're trying to scan these documents like they do with old headstones to try to bring out that text and make those files legible again. So if you had originally requested one of these records and they came back to you and said, no, I'm sorry, they would have, were destroyed, request them again. Because it's very possible that in the amount of time since you've requested them last, whether it was 16 years, six years, or six months, re-request these again to see if anything else has been able to be pulled out of these files. And it's very possible that one of these other record groups that they've been pulling information from has now been entered into their file as well. So even if you had gotten it in the past, try to re-request it again. There might be some additional information in there that you didn't have access in the first application process. <clears throat> so as I had mentioned earlier, 
You can go and visit the archives. Records are available on a rolling schedule for 62 years after today's date. So you would have access to those records from September 23, 1955 and before. So if they were discharged before that date, they're now considered archival. They're available for you to, to use at any time. You can submit requests online as an email. You can request up to 25 records at a time. So if you know that you're going to be going down there, and since we're up here in Chicagoland, we're going to be making the five, five and a half hour drive, make sure that you're submitting as many records as you can to make it worth it for you so that you know, you're getting everything available to you without having to go down multiple times. So they will not give you a research date to come down until you, they've actually pulled all of those files. You know, the research room is about this size. You know, there's maybe 10 to 15 tables. So, you know, they can't have everybody come down at the same time. So what they'll do is they'll tell you your records are available, and then you can choose your date. If that date's already booked, then they would have you choose an alternative date. Um, but they won't give you a date until they physically have everything in hand. You can bring your own equipment. You can bring your own cameras. You can bring your own flatbed scanners. What they do not allow is they do not allow the handheld wand scanners because they don't want you rubbing anything against the original files, because they are giving you the originals in most instances. If it's a fire record, you might get the photocopies. Um, but for the most part, they're bringing out the originals for you. And you'll see when I show you the court martials, you know, these were folded up into thirds, and nobody obviously had touched those records in 100 years. So it took a lot to try to get them flattened so that I could get a good photo of them. But you can bring equipment. You can use their equipment to make photocopies. They have camera stands that you can attach your camera to so you don't have to bring your own. Um, anytime you enter or leave the research room, they're going to go through your papers and stamp them to make sure you're not smuggling anything out. So, you know, don't bring a lot of stuff in with you. Have one sheet of paper that has your notes or have your notes on your phone or on your computer, which they will allow you to bring in, but they won't let you bring in stacks of paper really because it's, it's complicated for them to make sure that you're not taking a document out sandwiched in between. You don't need to make an appointment to view their microfilm. They have an extensive microfilm collection. You can come down and use that anytime you'd like. You can come down and look at the books that they have in the research library anytime you'd like. The only time you need an official appointment is if you're looking at the original textual records. Um, you'll need a research card, so you'll have to bring a photo ID that has your, your home address on it. So you're not going to be able to bring your passport. You need something with an address. So now what do they have? So they have not only the official military personnel files, but they have what are called burial case files. This is specifically for World War I. They have court martial records. They have the morning reports, the muster rolls and rosters that Deb talked about, and the U.S. Army daily sick reports. Um, they also have recently acquired um, the IDPFs, which is the individual deceased persons files for the Second World War. Um, when I was there earlier this spring, they were up to the P's. So they probably have received them all by now. They were getting those from Fort Knox. Um, and they've also just acquired merchant marine records um, that span that time period all the way up into the 1950s. So they're adding collections all of the time. So if you check their website or if you um, um, have a blog that you follow, a lot of times they'll post that in things like Dick Eastman's blogs and things like that. So the official military personnel file, it does not include everything. We have a tendency to think that the kitchen sink is going to throw, be thrown into these records, and they're not. So while that gave us some very good examples, you know, they're not going to have specifics about army battles or engagements. They're going to tell you where they're stationed, but they're not necessarily going to tell you the minute-by-minute -minute details of what action they might have seen while they were stationed um, overseas or while they were involved in the war. They're going to tell you their service dates. They're going to give you their military station, the camps, the bases. Um, all of the units that they were a part of, if they had schooling. So if they went to chemical warfare service gas training school, that's going to be listed in their records. If they went to Northwestern and they were going through officer training school, that's going to be listed in those records. Any decorations earned, you know, any, like their, um, their war medals, you know, it would list the war medals that they had earned and any promotions that they had received. Um, so I have one, my Angus, who went from supply sergeant to full-blown sergeant, and you could see the promotion dates listed right into his record. Um, requests can be submitted using the form 13173. On the back table, and for those who are watching, um, in the handout section, I gave you a couple of examples. 
um, of how to fill out those forms. One of them is the, the request form for the official military personnel file, and the other one is the form that you'll use for everything else. So when I talk about court martials, when I talk about burial case files, that's the form that you'll use um, for those types of records. Like I said, you can fax them, you can email them, um, you could put it in the mail and send it by snail mail, um, but if you're doing it by mail, by email, you can only do 25 at a time. I gave you a different one this time as opposed to last time. So here's another one of those examples of a final payment role for a soldier who was detached from a unit separate from the unit in which he served during the war. As I was stating earlier, for those of you who might not have seen the presentation this morning, as people are returning home from the expeditionary forces and they're arriving in their camps in order to be discharged, Sometimes so many men are coming through at a time that they're trying to move them through as fast as they can. So what they're doing is they're rounding them up by numbers and discharging them as a batch. So a thousand of them, giving them a unit and discharging them. Here's another one of those cases where that was the case. It's the second company discharge detachment. It's not the unit in which the soldier served. Um, it's just the unit in which, which he was discharged from the military using. So I was able to go and use that date go into the county records and find the date that he filed his discharge papers. Um, unfortunately for me, he used the same discharge unit instead of his original unit. Um, so it corroborated that, but I knew better. Um, this particular soldier was discharged through Kane County. He was discharged through the city of Aurora. And Aurora had put out a book at the time that was called With the Colors of the Flag from Aurora. And it was a history of the boys who served in the First World War. And in that book, he states that he's in the 23rd Aero Squadron. So I was able to then go and find the records that way. But, you know, don't assume that that is a legitimate unit that they served their entire military service within. So if it doesn't make sense and you're not finding any records that way, try to dig a little deeper to see if you can find out where he truly served. Like Deb had showed you, you'll see a record like this. If you look on the top of it, it tells me that he's in the air service. <coughs> That's different than the discharge detachment. So by looking at the payment vouchers, it tells me who the captain was of the unit that's discharging him at Camp Grant. But it tells me that he was originally a member of the Air Service, you know, and that he was a sergeant first class. The cool thing about these records is it gives you their actual signatures on their papers. So it's not a company clerk who's writing, signing on their behalf. The actual soldier is signing off that they've received their final payment voucher and they've been paid for their service. So it's, it's kind of cool just to at least have their signature. Um, so if you're like me and you do, you know, you dabble in handwriting analysis, it's kind of neat to see, um, to analyze some of these signatures. If you are lucky enough that you had somebody who served in the Navy, those records are very much intact and they can have a, an awful amount of detail in them. So in this particular Craig, uh, case, Hugh Craig had served in the Navy, tells me that he enlists from Emporia, Kansas. It gives me his date of birth. Now, for some people, this is going to predate state vital records. And in this case, for Nebraska and for Kansas, it absolutely does. So in Kansas, they don't have birth records before 1911. So you know, here's verifiable proof of his date of birth that he's supplying on his enlistment records. Um, they fingerprinted him, so his thumb is on the front, and when you flip it over, it has... Now, uh, his remaining fingers on the back side. It tells you whether or not he had any disabilities or any um, physical defects, you know, so it tells you whether he's got moles, whether he's got things like that. All of that information is provided. What's really cool about this one is the fact that his dad is listed as his next of kin, and it gives his dad's address as being in Emporia, Kansas, and then it's crossed out, and an address in Kansas City is written next to it. When I look through other papers, his, uh, his insurance policy, which is included in here, his insurance policy has the same information and it's lined out and it says, my dad moved to Kansas City in April. So now I know exactly when, which I've been wondering for quite some time, I have the exact month that his dad left Emporia, Kansas and moved to Kansas City, which is kind of cool. So what you'll see inside for Navy records is the fact that they will tell you every ship and station every port of call in which they've landed. And it gives you the dates, specifically the dates. So it tells me that he's at you know, the Great Lakes Naval Training Station and that he's there in July of 1918. It tells me that he's been on the USS Alabama. It tells me that you know, all of the ships and all of the dates that they had come into port. 
that gives you a ton of information when you're trying to figure out using newspaper resources, using other state resources exactly when you know, he's arriving in a different place at a different time. And I love the fact for naval records, they spell all of that out for me and give me all that detail. So if it's less than a month, then they're going to tell me. You know, otherwise, as you could see, they did it once a month. So you have January, you have February, you have March, you have April, you have May. And then for June, from June to July, he was stationed there for less than one month, and they stamped it that way. So you can kind of keep a chronological record of everywhere that they're going. Another cool piece of information that was in this file, this goes to his, his bonus that he was going to be receiving. So it tells me his dates of service here on the home front and the dates of service in which he served overseas because some soldiers would receive additional funding if they served in the AEF versus serving stateside. And it also tells me that as the date of this in February of 1925, he has since gotten married and it gives me the name of his wife, which wasn't he wasn't married during his regular service, so his dad is listed as next of kin. Once he gets married, his wife Edith is listed as next of kin. And then it gives the amount of his bonus, which is $340. So these are some absolutely great records that you can get your hands on. Um, how many of you have Navy, First World War Navy veterans? Not, there aren't very many, I will be honest. You know, when you have four million people from the U.S. who serve, you know, a small proportion of them are actually coming from the Navy and the Marines. Um, so the downside is, you know, there aren't going to be as many of these kind of robust files. But the positive side is if you're lucky enough to have one, it's going to give you a lot of detail about his service in the war. One of the interesting files in his particular um, uh, service record is the fact that it lists the court-martial date. I've yet to actually physically find the court-martial, so it must not have been severe enough to wind up at St. Louis in the records for the court-martials through St. Louis. Um, but in his file, it does state that he, did, he was brought before a court-martial jury. So now, burial case files. How many of you have had veterans who were killed during the First World War? You know, as Deb had mentioned, you had the ability to either have that soldier or sailor shipped home, or you could opt to have them remain in Europe at one of the American cemeteries. There are over six American cemeteries that are strewn throughout um, France and Belgium and the Netherlands. So there are multiple locations where those graves were buried. But it was also a multi-step process. Because if you've ever had somebody who's died in the service, they don't bury you just once, unfortunately. In some instances, they can bury you as many as three to five times. Um, what they would do is they would bury you um, in a temporary grave right at the site, wherever it happened to be. And then they would come back for you later and move you to a more permanent location. So every time a soldier is buried and then disinterred and then reburied, there's a piece of paper that goes into these files. So there are records, there are burial case files that apply to people who died of the flu stateside and who were just sent home. And they're just, it's just a single page document. And that single page document just has like three sentences on it that says, you know, this person died of influenza, his body was shipped back to and gives the name of the family or the military base. I mentioned that record group 393 where they had the burial orders in those documents. You get a little bit more information out of those than the burial case files. The burial case files are really designed for people who die in the AEF, who die overseas in France and in Germany. There really isn't much that they provided for those who died stateside. So it would include info about their burial. It does not include information about details of their death. Those are a different type of record, um, and they don't have them for the First World War. So I mentioned IDPFs for World War II, which would tell you exactly what happened. Those aren't the kind of case files that they have for the First World War. So they're not going to give you details of whether or not they were, you know, died by shrapnel or wounds. You know, they're not going to describe what happened that day. They're just going to tell you about the actual burial process. So when the next of kin was informed, they were sent a letter, and that letter asked, okay, well, who is the official person who is eligible to be considered next of kin? Is it the wife? Is it the mother and father? Is it a brother or sister? And what they would do is they would give you one of these forms and they would ask you to fill it out. So what we see here is that they ask if the soldier was married. So in this case for John Schwackhammer, he was killed you know, on the Meuse-Argonne offensive. Um, he was hit by shrapnel. He was hit by a bomb and killed. You know, he, they ask, was he married? No, he was not. So then 
who is in charge? Who is the next of kin? Well, the father is deceased as well. So his father can't be next of kin. So then they move on to his mother, Eliza, who gives her address and then gives the names of his siblings. You know, so this can be some really useful information if you know, it's a family that you're researching and you might not know how many brothers or sisters they have. Or if you didn't know that his dad had died before him, that's information that's going to be provided to you. So when they mailed out this form to her, they asked her what did she want to have. And he says by the quartermaster general you know, in Europe that you know, it's proposed not to return the body. So what they're saying is, we'll, we'll return the body if you insist, but we'd prefer to keep them here. And you can imagine why. It's easier to take care of the body than shipping it 2,000 miles overseas you know, in order to get it back to New York. And at first, she says, no, I want his body to be brought back. And she fills out the paperwork, and on the form, she says, I want him returned. As the process is evolving, she says, I just spoke to a woman who has been at that cemetery, that American cemetery. I want him to stay where he is. So they had to stop the process and then document on everything that she's asking that the body remain overseas. So you'll see that in most of the notes where it will say, has elected to, to leave the body in, in Europe. So here's an example of the forms that they'll ask you. Hopefully they came out a little bit better in the handouts than what we see on the screen right here. But almost every single one of them says the same thing. This one is for a soldier named Everett Cooper who was killed. He was in, died in an accident. He was in the first balloon squadron. Does anybody know what the balloon squadrons were? They would go up and observe the war and they would report back where the troop lines were. Well, his balloon was shot down, and he crashed and was killed um, when his balloon crashed. And in the record, it tells you where he was, exactly where he was stationed. It gives some information about him and his unit and his military service number. And then they start giving you the details about the body and the burial. And almost every one of these says the exact same thing. And they all say that the body is badly decomposed and unrecognizable. And then they say, how are they identified? And they say they're either identified by a tag or by their dental records. So this one says that he was buried originally in a wooden casket and in his uniform and wrapped in burlap. And then this form just is kind of a continuation of what that was, you know, that they're asking for the requisition of his disposition. What, what do the remains look like? Here's another set of documents that are in that same file. If, he's, if you're identified by your dental records, then they give you a view of what those dental records look like. How many cavities, how many teeth missing, what's going on. They ask, you know, are there any wounds or visible marks on the body? Well, none visible. You know, and then they're telling you tag on the body reads Everett C. Cooper, and that they're corroborating that with the tag that was registered to the grave. So the, tag, the dog tag on the body and the dog tag on the headstone are what are making sure that they have the same person. Now. The date on these, and here's the reason why almost every one of them say the exact same thing, is because these are done between 1921 and 1925, right? So you're talking three years after the war. So these bodies have been in the ground already for three years, not in sealed caskets, just in the ground. You know, so that's why the vast majority of these say body is unrecognizable. They're going by the physical evidence associated with the particular burial. <coughs> In this particular case for John Kelly, his body asked, his family asked that his body be returned to him. And if they return the body, then you're going to get all of that shipping information that's going to go along with the transport. So they would send telegrams ahead of time that would say, expect to be at the train station at this time because the train is, it's, they're going to be on this train at this time and they're going to be arriving at 8 p.m. So this would be sent to the family. So he arrives at Boston Station and he's slowly being moved onto the city of Joliet to be buried. So, you know, it tells us all of the places where the body stops, all of the train stations where they've pulled into the station in order to document, to tell the family, send a telegram ahead to say we're either on time or we're running late and when to expect us. So they were anticipating being there by 3 p.m. And he actually died from the flu. If the remains were brought back, you're going to find that paperwork that's detailed in here. So their final resting place in the local cemetery. The sexton would have to be there with the family to claim the body, and the sexton would then become responsible for making sure that the remains either get to a funeral home or to a church to have a ceremony, or be brought right to the cemetery in order to be reinterred. 
and you would find that directly listed in their paperwork. If they decided to leave the body overseas, then there were three years in which the U.S. Army offered to pay widows and mothers to bring them overseas in order to pay their respects to the soldiers who were interred in Europe. So between 1928 and 1931, they took, you know, hundreds, you know, almost 100,000 um, family members overseas in order to pay their respects to the graves of their husbands or to their sons or to their brothers. And all of that paperwork is included in the burial case file. So if you have a soldier who died and you know that his wife or his mother went overseas, then all of that is going to be detailed in these files. So in this particular case, here's the letter that was sent to Miss Eliza Swackhammer, and it was a standard form letter, and everybody receives the same letter. It says that, you know, records in this office show that you are the mother of John Schwackhammer. You know, he's interred in this cemetery overseas. You know, we are offering you the opportunity to come overseas and pay your respects. Um, this one's 1929. Well, unfortunately for the Schwackhammers, Eliza had already passed away by this time. She passed away in 1928. Um, and since he didn't have a sister and he didn't have a widow, then there was nobody to go on his behalf. But the Army didn't know that. They didn't know that she had already passed away. So they sent the letter to her just like they would send it to anybody else. So the women, the mothers who did take them up on this offer, there's photos of all of them. So if they actually went overseas, they had to have a passport. They had to have a visa in order to go. So the Army or the Navy documented each one of the, the spouses or the mothers who went overseas. They took a photo of them. They gave them all the documentation that they would need in order to go overseas. So you had an itinerary. You would bunk with somebody else, whether it's a family member, a daughter, or somebody that you're bringing with you, or one of the other widows or mothers and they would give you the hotel, the, the, the ship information, everything that you needed, the train schedules, and they would bring them over just like any other tour group, and they would all go together. Maggie was a bit different, so she decided she wanted to stay on for a little bit of extra time. So they had to mark in her file that she was staying, and on the back side, I'll show you that card, it says she's going to come home on her own that she decided to stay. But they, they didn't just take them to the cemetery and then bring them home. They let them do a little shopping, as you see. You know, special shopping excursions were provided. They got to see the sites when they were in Paris and in other locations. Um, so it wasn't just, we're taking you out to the cemetery. The hotels in which they stayed were all documented. The ships, the dates of arrival and the dates that they were leaving were all documented. You know, tells us who her son was who was killed in service. He was in the air service. You know, that she was 61 years old. They had to do detailed health surveys on these people before they took them overseas. And those are included in these records as well. And Maggie Stafford's, you know, Mrs. Stafford's record, as I'm reading through it, is a very lengthy and unique set of documents because she appeared to be a little bit of a hypochondriac. So she threw everything plus the kitchen sink into her medical reports. You know, so they tell us that you know, she's on a restricted diet and that you know, she's had a perforated eardrum since she was seven years old. But apparently it decided to act up on the trip and she needed medical attention to have somebody look at it. You know, most of these, it's just a file, a file card or two. She had like 18 file cards in the couple of weeks that she was overseas. And in one record, you know, nervousness, hypertension, high blood pressure, insomnia, wants to go see a chiropractor while she's in France, you know, does not wish to take the bus ride with everybody else. She wants to just be left alone. I mean, you name it. I mean, this woman. And as you get towards the end, it actually says, yes, she has hypertension, but also a little bit of hypochondria. This is it right in her record. And she was a nervous Nellie, really, to think about it, because she was constantly sending letters back and forth with the quartermaster's office. Well, I'm shipping my luggage. Is my luggage going to be OK? Is somebody going to be there to get it? You know, what happens if somebody takes my luggage? Like, she was just very anxious about the entire process. So I'm sure by the time she got back to the States, they were all just like, oh, see. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I never have to hear records. And her file was so lengthy, I finally just started sampling. I couldn't, I couldn't copy it all anymore because my camera was almost full. That's how many pages this woman's file had in her, her record going overseas to visit her son's grave. So most of them aren't that elaborate, but in this particular case, 
you know, she must have given the quartermaster just fits. I can only imagine. Um, but there's a lot of decent information that comes out of these records. And really, like I had said, as a family historian, you know, while it doesn't provide a lot of genealogical data other than the sheet showing the brothers and sisters and the parents, it kind of gives you a little bit more of an understanding of what the process was like and how the army helped the families grieve and to heal. So they give them the option to come back and pay their respects. They give them the option to bring their, their sons and daughters home if they so chose. So, you know, they really tried hard. Court martial records can be a lot of fun. The downside to court martial records is that the index lives at the National Archives in College Park, and the records live in St. Louis. So when Deb and I were at the National Archives in College Park, I filled out 15 requests for court martial records just to be told, we don't have those here. Those are in St. Louis. So the index lives in one place. The original records live in another. So look, look, luckily, I could keep those and bring them with me to submit them to St. Louis on that form. But they're going to have a detailed list of charges. They're going to tell you the actual testimony, word for word testimony, both from the eyewitnesses, from the accused, and from the officers who are hearing the testimony. The general order and special order, remember how I said special orders aren't really always special orders. So if somebody's brought before the tribunal or they're brought before court martial, that goes into those special order records. So for Camp Dodge, you know, it would show me chronologically the guys who are brought before court martial for missing curfew or being drunk on the job or going AWOL and it would be listed in with the rest of the orders for that day. They would give you a record of the, the, record of the summary court. So basically what that means is, you know, they hear they're claiming not guilty, he's found guilty, okay, what's the summary of what actually happened? And then if they try to appeal, then they're going to give you the summary of that as well, and then your verdict. These can be very lengthy. They could be, you know, several dozen pages long, or they could be very short and to the point. So this one for Sam Addison, I wish I could have met Sam Addison, and I'll tell you why. So here's one of those special orders that you find in record group 393, you know, special order number 88, listing the charges that Sam P. Addison had gone AWOL from the 4th Company, Fort Scraven, Georgia, you know, that the finding is that he's guilty. He claims not guilty, but the finding is that he's guilty, and then his sentence. All of that shows up in the actual court-martial transcripts. So the record, rec record of summary court says the same thing. So it's telling you exactly what the verdict is, you know, that he has to serve hard labor, here are the dates he's going to serve hard labor, and the judge that signs off on it, it's going to tell you the date of the hearing and what the final verdict is. But then in the testimony, and these are backwards, this is actually page one and this is page two, but they ask him, is there anybody who sits on this court-martial pa uh, panel whom you think should be removed? And he says, absolutely, I think, you know, Commander Musgrave should be removed because he's had a bias of me since the moment I set foot in the Army. And they ask Captain Musgrave, they said, do you have a bias? And he's like, absolutely, I do. He keeps leaving. So, <laughs> so in the testimony, in this very beginning, you know, they ask him, what does he want? And he says, I want him to be replaced. And the Army actually did it. They actually replaced him because, you know, his superior corroborated, yep, I've got something against him. And they removed him from, from the hearing. And then it goes on to hear the testimony from the witnesses. So this is one of my favorite cases. So they ask his dad, okay, you know, did you apprehend the accused? Yes, he did. Where was he? He was at home. He says, he's a, the, the, the examiner asks, he's a boy who loves his home a great deal and likes to be home, isn't he? Yes, sir, he's very fond of his home. You know, he's returned home to his family rather frequently, hasn't he, since joining the Army? Yes, sir, several times. <laughs> he went AWOL several times because he just wanted to go home. And then he says, well, how long has he been here? Well, he's been home for about a month. Why didn't you bring him back earlier? Well, I told him to go back himself, and he refused to go. So he, found, he says, I finally got him into my car and brought him back, brought him back to Fort Screven. So, you know, as you're hearing the testimony, you know, throughout the course of the court-martial, you know, they're asking, you know, it's about eight pages long. I didn't copy it all for you, you know, but they're asking him, well, why do you keep leaving? Well, because I like it better at home. <laughs> Don't we all? He actually goes on to have, over the course of his service, three court-martials. 
Why didn't they just dishonorably discharge him and send him home? I have no idea. But he had three different court martials, three, uh, two from um, Fort Scriven and then one when they were shipped to Texas. So he actually made it from Texas all the way back to Georgia the third time before he's apprehended and then sent back to be court-martialed again from a camp in Texas. So, you know, you get a lot of detail out of these witnesses and out of these testimonies. The ones that they have in St. Louis are things like robbery charges, drunkenness charges, AWOL charges. All of the ones that I went through, I did not have any that were serious crimes like murders, you know, or anything of the like like that. These were all things that could be handled through hard labor without um, putting them in jail. So these are cool to look at, but you can see, you know, that they were still folded from the originals, you know, in these tight little documents. And when I got there to look at them, they said, you know, we've had these under presses for a month, and they still look like this. They were still very folded up. So nobody had touched them in a hundred years. But I would love to find the descendants of Sam Addison and ask them <laughs> some a little bit about their grandpa. So now morning reports, which Deb had alluded to a little bit earlier, they're going to include things like the strength of and the supply of the particular units. So do they have enough supplies? You know, do they have enough men? Do they have enough food? Do they have enough rifles? Do they have enough um, blankets? It's going to include the movement of the unit and the company. So if a unit moves and a company stays behind, that's going to be represented. It's going to include, like Deb said, any remarks on monthly transfers, so people who are entering in and who are leaving that particular unit. If they're left behind because they're in the hospital, that's going to be documented. If they're promoted, it's going to be documented. And then people who are given leave or furloughs are documented as well. Now, these are all on microfilm. You can view the original documents if you need to, but they'll push you to the microfilm first in order to find it listed in the index. And then once you find it listed in the index, then you can request the originals. And here's how the microfilms are labeled. They're labeled by unit and they're labeled by division. You know, so they'll have them all together, 312, 313, 314. They're all just listed one right after the other. So it makes it easier to find. You just open up the drawer and look for the type of unit in which you're seeking. I had to go through multiple reels because I had guys who were on Company A's records, which were in here, and then people who were in Company D's records, which wound up on the next reel. So you just need to make sure that if there's multiple reels for that division, it helps to know what the company is, otherwise you're going to be going through reels trying to figure out exactly what, um, what unit that particular person, that company that particular person is in. So here's an example of what they look like. So it gives you the strength, it tells you how many men you have, how many corporals, how many sergeants, how many lieutenants, how many recruits, right? It tells me that they have 132 that are available for service. Um, tells you how many they have present, so it kind of tells you that you have six guys who are uh, maybe out on leave. It could just be the difference between the officers and um, the enlisted men who are included in that. And remember what I said about cavalry? Remember I mentioned that earlier? They still have it on their forms. Even in the First World War, they're still listing how many horses and mules a unit might have um, during the First World War. So there's some interesting things out of these. They tell you a little bit about what's going on in the unit. So it gives you the name. Private Brown is ready for duty. You know, he was in the hospital at Fort Anderson. Or Private Anderson has been in the hospital. So it tells you a little bit about what's been going on. They don't always give you names. A lot of times you'll just find records where it says three men were sent to the hospital. You know, but they don't tell you exactly who those three men are. Or, you know, we took shelling and we had six men who were injured by artillery shell, but they don't tell you who those six men are. So it'll give you a little bit of background, but it might not give you the specific soldier's name when you're looking at these records. So now Deb already touched on muster rolls and monthly reports. It includes, like she said, any previous service. You know, the units that they had been assigned, if they were in school getting training, it's going to give that listed if they were in officer training school or if they were in chemical warfare school or if they were in submarine school. It's going to provide all that for you. It's going to give you their service number, their enlistment, their assignment date. It's going to tell you when they were actually mustered in. And it's going to give you the list of soldiers per unit and each company each month. So like Deb said, this might be the only visible physical evidence that you have that somebody was in a particular unit. 
and they come in handy. This is very similar to the one Deb showed. This one's for the 311th engineers stationed out of Camp Grant. And this is just for the period from September to October 31st. And then it's always, it's always worth it to read. Don't skip this because it gives you the details about what type of data they're collecting and why they're collecting it. If you don't read through, like if you just flip to the back to look for the list of soldiers, then you miss what their requirements are. And there might have been a piece of information why somebody is not recorded, you know, under one of their extra sheets or maybe listed under their, do, you know, their do's and don'ts, you know, their abbreviations. You're wondering what an abbreviation stands for. Don't skip over this. Make sure you at least glance through it to see if it has, you know, that information that um, might be useful to reading the records. So here's an example. It starts with the officers. It shows me the captain of the unit. It shows me the first lieutenant. And what's cool about these is it tells you everything that they did up until this time. So it tells me that as the commission cap the captain of the engineers on June 5th, so he was assigned to active duty. It tells me they sent him to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. You know, it wasn't until he got to Fort Leavenworth that they assigned him as captain of the 311th engineers. You know, it tells me that he joined that regiment in August you know, and that he's been commanding the company since that date when he arrived. Now, your lieutenants and your officers might interchange. They might go back and forth. You know, this tells us that he's commissioned in June of 1917 as well, and that he was on leave. Says that, you know, he was out from August 14th until September 2nd when he came back. He was in engineer officers training school in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. So that's an important piece of information because then you can go take that and look for the training school records and documents for Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. You know, it tells me that he's ordered to temporary duty with the 311th as of September. So that tells me he's not going to stay here. That tells me that he's only temporarily assigned and that I'm going to have to follow his personnel file to find out if he was shipped off to another unit after that. Like Deb had mentioned, here's a copy of the records for the individual soldiers. So it tells me the date in which they enlisted, and it tells me where they were before. So they enlisted, and the first place they were sent was to Camp Grant, and they were assigned into this unit. And that's the same for all of these men, you know, most of them. You've got some that predate October. There's a couple Septembers in here, you know, but as soon as they're inducted, they're being shipped to Camp Grant in order to be entered into this engineer corps. Those monthly rosters like Deb talked about, you know, where they're showing everybody who happens to be in that unit at that particular time. Again, by rank, so you're seeing your captains, your lieutenants, your sergeants, your corporals, your privates, and then all the rest of the enlisted men. It's not providing you much detail, but it's giving you the name of the soldier and his service number. So when you're trying to verify service, this could be an important piece of information. So many of you have heard me even today lament about trying to research my Angus. So Angus McDonald served. He was in the Coastal Artillery Corps, and he was in the 45th Supply Company, meaning that all he did was supply information, supply you know, food, supply equipment to other artillery units within the Coastal Artillery Corps. So those records were separate from the rest of the Coastal Art Artillery Corps records. So we went, I went to Kansas City, I went to St. Louis, I went to the National Archives, I went to the National Archives too, and kept striking out and couldn't prove that he was actually a member of this particular unit. Even going through the microfilm rolls and looking at the morning reports, no mention of Angus as being a member of that. It wasn't until I got to Archives 2, where in the supply company folder within the 45th CAC found a little slip of paper in there that said that Angus was being promoted from supply sergeant to sergeant and gave the date. And Deb can tell you I cried like a baby after six years of research to finally verify that yes Angus had served and that yes Angus had gone overseas and was a member of the AEF. When I got back I contacted St. Louis and um, there's a wonderful gentleman there who works there. I won't give you his name because I don't want you all to steal my resource. Um, but he was able to go into the monthly rosters and follow Angus, not only from being stateside in Georgia, but following him all the way over through the AEF in France and in Germany. So those records are on order, um, and hopefully they will arrive soon. Those are the records I was waiting for. But here's another record. Here's the final roster for that particular unit as the unit is being discharged and mustered out. This is a hospital corps record, I believe. Um, but it gives the names of the people 
and that they're honorably or dishonorably discharged. So it tells me that he's dishonorably discharged for fraud, that he's honorably discharged even though he was a minor, you know, a minor, he was underage. Um, so it's giving you all of the details about that. So don't just look for the dates of service that your soldier served. Make sure you look all the way to the end when the unit is disbanded because they might reference them in one of these final rosters or one of these final roles. So you want to make sure that you follow them all the way to the end, even if they go past the war, because you want to see in case they're cross-referenced in another set of documents. I'm holding up our right so far. So now morning sick reports, the monthly sick reports. I used these when I was doing my research on the flu pandemic. And basically all they are are lists of the people who are hospitalized or who are sick and are quarantined from other people during military service. So it's its own microfilm reel. They're done by, again, by station and by unit. And they're telling you what the departments are. Is it a hospital unit? Is it a brigade? Is it a battery? What does it happen to be? And then they're giving you the names of the soldiers within that month who have been reported for sick leave. So it gives me the name of the officer or the enlistee. It gives me the date that they've taken sick. It tells me did they get ill during the line of duty. These are all going to say yes for the most part because all of them are active military service. And then it's going to tell you what happened to them. So the vast majority of them go to the hospital. You had a couple lucky guys who were able to remain in, in their quarters who were able to be quarantined and kept within their record. Every one of those people had the flu. So that entire page after page after page for this particular hospital, every one of them were in there because they had either diagnosed as flu or diagnosed as pneumonia. Take advantage of the books and the research tools that the library and that the archives has available to you. So they have a very extensive research library on site within the research room that you can use to your advantage. And the two things that are most important, because nobody in my family is in the military, the structure of the military is not necessarily um, a concept that I'm familiar with. So when people talk about divisions and units and companies and battalions, that doesn't always convey itself into my brain. So there are two books that are very important. So you have the Army Posts, Camps, um, Cantonments, and Depots. So that lists every single station, whether it's a camp, whether it's a fort, you know, whatever it happens to be, whether it's Camp Dodge, whether it's, you know, Camp Funston, it's going to have a separate page for every single one of those. And it's going to tell you when it started. It's going to tell you how many people were there. It's going to tell you what units, what companies were stationed there. So whether they were engineers, whether they were coastal artillery, whether they were aero squadrons, it's going to tell you every single unit that, that was there, and they're going to tell you when they were there. So it's going to tell you when they started and when they disembarked for another location. So I haven't found it online. It might be available online. I haven't been able to find a copy in Internet Archives or through Hathi Trust, um, but they have it at the National Archives too, and they have a copy in St. Louis as well. Another one that's really useful is the organizational directory of the US Army and they have this for every year. So remember how I said people could be moved from one unit to another? They might start in the machine gun battery and then they're moved to an infantry or to another unit throughout their course of the war. They do these yearly. So you want to look at the one for 1917, you want to look at the one for 1918, you want to look at the one for 1919 to see did that unit disband? Was that unit merged with another organization? Did that unit um, stay stateside or did they go overseas? And it's going to provide all of that information for you. So here's what it looks like. So here's the first book. So here's what it says about Kelly Field. You know, it tells me that it's strictly for aviation. It tells me that they can be reached through Western Union. It tells me how they were shipping soldiers in and out. And if somebody wanted to write to a unit, that they could write to their own post office. You know, concentration camp for enlisted men. You know, their hospital bed capacity is 264. So you might read that and say, it doesn't matter to me how many beds the hospital can, can hold, but when I talk about the flu at the end of the day, 
that hospital bed count is really important when you're looking at records. Because if you've got 10,000 guys sick and only 200 beds in which to put them in, that makes a big difference to the type of care that they're going to receive. And then, like I said, the organizational directory tells you if somebody's in the coastal artillery, here are the units for the coastal artillery and where they're stationed, how to reach them, and when are they going to be decommissioned. You know, so Angus was in the 45th. They were de demobilized in 1919, so they no longer existed. But the rest of these groups were sent back to their original base camps, you know, across the country. So knowing what happens to the, your unit, you're not going to get that from an official military personnel file. They're not going to tell you when the unit is disbanded. They're just going to tell you when your soldier leaves the military, when he's been released from service. So knowing the structure and how things work, and these are done by units. So if you're looking at the first division, it's going to show you all of the units that fall under the first division. And then it'll go to the second division, and the third division, and the fourth division, all the way up into the 80s. And it'll show you the 88th division has all of these groups underneath it, to which case the 313th Engineer Corps is one of them. So it helps you follow the food chain up to figure out where your records could live so that you can understand how does somebody who's in the 313th relate to the 88th division. What is that chain of title? What is that chain of command, so to speak? So that you're getting a full understanding of how they're fitting into their place in the Army. So when you have these groups that are, that are one-offs from the official divisions, like hospital corps, ambulance corps, nursing corps, coastal artillery corps, how are they fitting into the larger picture of the U.S. military? And then that makes it easier for how to find those records. When you go to the National Archives, that was much kinder than I would be, what I would have to say. Um, they expect you to know. And if you don't understand what the structure is, you don't know what to ask for. So if you can look at one of these books in advance and see that, okay, the Coastal Artillery Corps is actually in the 6th Artillery, I need records for the 6th Artillery. If you don't know that, they can't really help you. You know, you need to be able to look at books like this in advance in order to drill into that data, in order to make them useful. So if you're going to go to St. Louis to look at these other types of records, make sure that you're looking at these types of books so that you're not missing something. You don't want to have to drive five hours. You don't want to have to drive seven hours back to Kansas City. You don't want to have to take a plane ride back to D.C. You know, because you didn't look at the organizational structure before you left. So I am happy to answer questions about the types of records that I have there. Isn't Anna adorable? I would love to have had Anna as my mother versus, you know, Mrs. Stafford. You know, she's a good busha, isn't she? Her son had died, um, had died from Juliet, and her records were in, in those burial case files. Yeah? I have two questions. The first one, you said that when they were identifying bodies that they used dental records, so that I assume they took those when they came in, so they were with their file. I have not seen them in any other type of file, but they must have had to have. So those records might live in with the records for the dental corps, because there were veterinary corps, there was dental corps, there were, you know, all of these other separate records, but I've not seen dental records in official military personnel records, and I have not seen them in other files either. So they would have had to have done it, I don't know if they're doing it at the time of death and they're comparing it to records back home. That I don't know. But if they had records, they were recording it on there. If you had teeth to have. Canada, Canada kept dental records. Canada kept dental records, too. My second question relates, all through this you're talking about going there. Is it possible to do it by mail? Yeah, you can, but they're going to tell you to hire a researcher. So unless you have one question and you're looking for just one thing, then they'll probably be able to pull it for you. But if you're asking for their file and you want information on out of record group 120 and you want information out of record group 393 and you want information out of record group 111, they're going to tell you to hire a researcher. And they do have lists of researchers that are available to you to contact somebody. But like with Angus, I said, I need the morning report. And he said, OK, I'll get it for you, because it was just one thing. But if I wanted everything there, I'd have to hire somebody to do it. So I have to know ahead of time that 
You have to know what you need. And you have to be very specific. So when you contact them, you need to tell them that it's in record group 120, but where in record group 120? Because it's millions of pages long. So you need to be able to say that it's in the burial transport files or that it's in the casualty index reports. And you have to be able to provide them the numbers that you find in the catalog record. There are two types of records. There's what's called an ARC record, which is a, a long seven or eight digit number that shows up at the top of the online catalog record. That's garbage. It means nothing. It's only to track the online record. The record, the piece of data that you would need to contact the archives to ask for is at the bottom of the record and it says HM, HM, or is it HRS, HMS slash NRL. And then it gives you like an A1 comma 323 that drills right down to the exact file and folder. So that's the piece of information. In the, like if you find something online, a catalog record online, and it gives you the name of the file, it tells you the record group that it's in, it tells you the file, the collection, who the, the, the creator of the record is, you know, Department of Commerce, you know, whatever it happens to be. At the bottom of that, there's a record. It says HMS slash, and then it gives you that A1 or A2 or A6. That's exactly the book they're going to pull off the shelf to find that record. That's the index number. So when you go to the National Archives, either in College Park or in DC, the walls are lined with three ring binders. And those three ring binders give the shelf location in the stacks where they can find that particular record. So if I can give them the A1, 323, they can pull that file look in the index record and it says, okay, it's seven boxes and they're alphabetical and I want the M's, then they know to just pull the M's. You know, so that number at the very bottom is the record you would give the archives. Now, if you want somebody to go and do research for you, then you would just give them the record groups and the materials that you're looking for. You could give them that HMS number as well, but it's not as important for the researcher because they're looking broader than just for that one item. Can't just tell them a name. No. 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 They don't have the staff. They don't have the resources have the to be able to go and do research just on the name. And believe it or not, we think that names are unique, and they're absolutely not. So when I went to the archives to do research on Angus, his name was Angus Leroy McDonald. There were two of them. And they were both from Illinois. One was from downstate, and then there was my Angus. So names that we think are very unique aren't unique at all. So you know, you either would have to go there. Because nobody can think like you can think. Nobody can make that connection to records like you can. Even if you hire a researcher, they can't think like you can. So if you have the ability to go, you're going to get more out of it than sending somebody. And if you're going to contact the archives, they're only going to look for one thing. You know, they're not going to look for anything on him. They're just going to pull what you ask. Does that make sense? They just don't have the ability to do it. <laughs> well, the next time Deb and I go back, you know, and those of you who know me know that when we go, we look for you guys. Like, you know that we look for your records when you ask us to, so I'm happy to. Any other questions? Yeah? Did you say you don't need an appointment to use the microphone? <laughs> no, you don't. You still need a card, so you still need to stop at the gate, at the, at the door, they need to check you in, sit you down, have you watch a five-minute PowerPoint presentation on how to use records. They'll give you your research card, and then you can go in and look at the microfilm. And then, is there anything else you can look at? You can look at the books that they have, but the textual records, you have to have an appointment because they can't pull them for you that day because they're off-site. So that's why. And when you think about why it takes six to eight weeks to get a request back if you put it through by the mail, they're dealing with thousands of World War I vets who, or World War II vets who are dying every week. Those take precedence because they need to make sure they've got that info for burial headstones and military honors. So everybody else goes on a back burner and they work on them as they can. So when you send them a list of 25 like I do, it takes four months before I get a call back that says records are available. I put in a request in November. They called me March 23rd to tell me my records were available. So it takes, if you're looking for a couple, it'll be about six to eight weeks. If you're going to do it like a power user like I do, <coughs> expect it to take months before they contact you. And you can email them and say, hey, I'm just checking on the status, and they'll answer you, um, but they'll email you. They're very good about emailing you as soon as records are available. 
But if you go to the National Archives 1 or 2, you could just walk in the door and page records. It's only St. Louis that you need to make an appointment in advance. Anybody else? Nothing I'm on. Thank you for listening to my little froggy. <laughs> Hopefully I sound better by the end. The presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Tina. Thank you.